Hi, everybody. Dennis Allen with The Disciple Dilemma. I'm outside Washington, D.C., and I wanted to give you a little prequel on what we're going to go with today in our episode. The question is, is education the business of fact infusion, dumping facts into people's brains, or the development of the whole person in the vocational, that is the called life lived out? Can busy educators do whole person development? Should they do that? If you asked it another way, go to Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Jesus told us to go, to make, to baptize, to teach. Does that kind of a statement from Christ lay claim to our personal vocational life? So the subject on the disciple dilemma today is discipleship in the Christian academic community, the telos, the ethic, the ethos, and the praxis the way you practically implement that. Telos and praxis, how should educational leaders engage in their responsibilities in the academy as disciples with their students? Now, we have an eminently well-qualified guest today, Dr. Mike Harden. Mike is a people person, a Christ follower, who also happens to be a quant head. That's mathematics. Those usually don't go together. He's also an educator and an administrator. Mike serves as the provost, a vice president, and a professor of quantitative analysis at Stanford University in Birmingham, Alabama. His rap sheet includes discipleship, living as an entrepreneur, an ordained minister with an MDiv from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, a master's in math, a PhD in applied statistics, and this is the really important one. He's husband to a beautiful lady, Anna Catherine. Prior to his role at Stanford, Mike was the dean of the business school at the University of Alabama. Mike is a consultant for corporations, a scholar in residence for Loyola University. He's a visiting professor at Ireland's Trinity College, and a member of numerous professional associations and boards. Now, on top of Mike being with us, co-hosting along this steep climb with us today is Carmen LaBerge. Carmen is the host of Mornings with Carmen. It's heard every weekday morning on Faith Radio Network. She's also the author of Speak the Truth, How to Bring God Back into Every Conversation. Carmen has also served on the staff of churches ranging in size from micros to megas, so that helps us in the conversation around discipleship. And if you want to know more about her, you can connect with Carmen at www.carmenlaberge, L-A-B-E-R-G-E, carmenlaberge.com. Off we go. You know what's great is um, I went for 60 seconds with Sean McDowell and he leaned in like Carmen did and said, you know, you really ought to record this. <laughs> I'm just here to help. That's, that's all. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Mike Harden. You have been present in my life for a lot of years, and I'm really delighted to have you right here on my screen because not only have you been a teacher for me, but you've been a teacher and an educator, mentor for a lot of people. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for being with us on The Disciple Dilemma. Thank you very much. And Carmen, thank you for going with us on this ride. This is going to be a great one. And I'm so glad you're here with us. Um, I'm thrilled to join you. Thank you so much. Carmen, you got to read Mike's paper by all means possible. What did you think of that paper? Well, first I want to say thank you. Um, I do I do think that a recovery of what you're describing um, is in fact what, what we need across all Christian education, high, higher education, but also I know I would say that those institutions that are designed to feed students into Christian higher ed. And so thank you for that. What's the goal here? Like, what what's the elevator speech related to the paper? So then we can start pulling on it. The the paper that Dennis mentioned was an address that I gave to the faculty at our fall faculty meeting coming back. It was a reflection, uh, or my reflection on current trends in higher education that I had seen developing. And there was a recent book that had come out by, uh, called Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education. Uh, really foretelling what we are living with right now of a coming demographic cliff in higher education, meaning simply that during the, the recession of the 
2007, 2008 time period, the birth rate in this country dropped to an all-time low and actually has remained there. And, and in the book, uh, Nathan Gant talks about that, that means about a two to three million, uh, plus or minus a little bit, fewer students to be in the cohort of college aged coming in and what impact that was going to have. I'm a member of the baby boom. It, it, it was competitive all the way through. I can remember going to the library and trying to get some article out of a chemistry journal and the pre-med students would have already cut it out so that nobody else could get it. It was dog eat dog. We have experienced in higher education two cycles, the baby boom generation and then the baby boom echo, which ha we're coming out of, in which the model for higher education has been let's grow and add more students. We add students by adding amenities, et cetera. And so I saw this coming and I wanted to communicate to our faculty, look, there are at least several storms that I see on our horizon and how can we navigate through those? And so the demographic change was one of them. Uh, I think I talk about the technology change in another one. And then I also talk about just a general cultural or economic uh, changes that are going on. And so I tried to communicate the problems as well as what I thought some of the solutions could be for a place like Sanford. My sister and I had an idea on the demographic front. We mm. feel like there are people of an age I don't necessarily know how old they are, but they're not a whole lot older than me. And they would love to go back to school. And we'd like to live in community with each other. Like we now have lived long enough, you know, out mm. of community that we'd, we'd like to live in community again. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's potentially a future for people who actually have the means to pay for a college education now um, to go and get one. Um, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's degree, a degree track, and maybe it's not necessarily a degree track. Um, but if there are empty dorms across the country in, in institutions of higher ed, and they are, you know, and they have offer compelling programs. Anyway, I know there's some people out there that would be, I think, very interested in engaging in that way. So yeah. I think there are creative ways to address some of the challenges that are coming, but the challenges are real. What the demographic cliff means, though, is doing the status quo that we've always done, expecting that population of 18 to 22 year olds to be the financial fuel that fun that funds everything. We may have to re-envision re that. It also meant one thing that I tried to emphasize, we have to be very clear about who we are in terms of being a Christ-centered university. The market is going to squeeze out. You know, it, it'll be a little bit like in Revelation. The lukewarm will be spit out. I love this. I love exactly where we're going now. Now we're getting down to some business strategy. We can talk about capitalism. We can drive this thing along, right? So what's the sustainable competitive advantage for you guys in higher Christian education, right? Is it going to be better dorms and better cafeteria plans? Or what is the ethos that makes Christian higher education different from secular higher education? You were just starting to track on that one. Yeah. You know, my definition of what a Christian uh, education or Christian higher education is, is as follows. I see a Christian university being a community of Christian scholars bound together by an ethic of agape to be able to think, give each other space to vet ideas, but always know there is this safety net of this ethic of agape and love undergirding that, then that creates an environment for students to come be a part of that in a way that I think sets should set apart a Christian university from any other kind of university. Was that T loss, that being the ethos, the ethic, the the background, the T loss of this? <clears throat> was that something you experienced at Princeton, Carmen? So I think that when we talk about how how information 
uh, is communicated and imparted, like that's a part of the educational process, but the formation part is I think what we're talking about when we when we talk about the spirit of the community or um, what's expressed there. And um, what I learned at Princeton was how to put how how what the armor was that I needed, um, how to put it on and how to use it, um, both offensively and defensively. So Princeton thoroughly equipped me for the apologetics ministry that I've been called to. Um, but I would say that if you know, if Princeton Seminary really does exist to equip pastors for the reality of the church today, then no, you don't get that. You don't get formation. You don't. You get a lot of information, really good information, um, and you are expected to, uh, you know, acquire it and regurgitate it um, in in a in a manner uh, that is acceptable to whoever the reigning faculty of the day are, which changes. Um, and then you better be getting your formation in a discipling relationship one on one with a professor who's trustworthy or you got to go outside of the system there. You got to go outside of the of that particular environment to get it. The, the label Christian is not does not mean the same thing in every institutional setting, and it certainly changes over time. And so I think one of the conversations that is really helpful, Mike, to have um, with the people who are listening right now is how do parents discern? I mean, I'm I'm engaged in conversations with people who have their kids in really, really wonderful um, Christian high schools um, that are doing classical Christian education models, and their kids are eligible to go being accepted into some of the most elite schools across the country. And I am terrified and horrified for them. Like, I'm like, just because you got into Harvard doesn't mean that your child is prepared to, to go and live among wolves. Like, and so I, I just think that just because we imagine that the institutions of higher education that were at one point in time in our country, Christian, um, or they were, they grew out of, of Christian institutions, um, like their discernment is really needed among parents today. So I'm thinking about this as a leadership conversation, and I'm thinking about how you have a conversation with a board and a faculty to think a little bit about the things that we're talking about. And uh, so as background, three months ago, I got to give an address to the chief academic officers of ABHE. That's one of the accreditation boards for seminaries and Christian colleges. And the thesis that I presented was you're facing headwinds because you're competing secular strengths against your Christian community weaknesses, as opposed to your Christian strengths against secular community weaknesses. And the specifics that I raised were, one, the demographic cliff. You are going to see headcount falling off. So there's going to be incredible competition, right, for headcount. Um, and I, I love Carmen's idea that we need to grab a bunch of us and say, let's go back and learn the things that I actually got to see in or completely forgot about when I was, you know, not paying attention. I know that's not your story, Mike and Carmen. I know you guys are both A students, but I, you know, I think that's a great idea. But the, the, the sense of the conversation with these academic officers was number one, you're about to compete and you're going to have to compete on your strengths, not on your weaknesses, as opposed to competing with your weaknesses against your strengths. And secondly, the donor base is drying up and it's drying up for a couple of different reasons. One cost of capital is going up, scarcity of capital is going, you know, capital availability or scarcity of capital going up, availability of capital going down. We're going to see increasing pressure on endowments, on schools trying to deal with budgetary problems, capital and facility maintenance. I've got to imagine a Sanford, just like a Princeton, has a lot of property, plant, and equipment to keep up with. And if we're going to compete, my thesis was to the chief academic officers, you better start competing from a standpoint of you're going to develop the whole person, just as Mike laid this thesis out a few minutes ago. Disciples, you are in the business. This is, I'm going to tell you, I got some eggs thrown at me on this one. You're in the business of making disciples who happen to be then infused with the beauty of the facts and the knowledge that you bring in your specialty courses. But as an educator, your first priority is to make sure that the whole person has been developed 
And the second point is, did they pass the exam on the specifics that you want? Now, that drew about 20% of the audience into a fit of rage. In a Christian community, guys, why is that? Why didn't somebody say, yeah, that's what the Bible's all about? Am I oversimplifying this and making this too easy to be knocked down? What, what's my straw man look like to you? I'm really not surprised. I think what we have had over the last 30 to 40 years in Christian higher education is uh, we have been in competition with the secular intellectual world. There is a very famous book uh, called The Dying of the Light, and it takes and does case studies of a number of universities that were initially founded from the church, by the church, for the church, and it shows they're drifting away from that center. And it's in part, as as we bring in faculty, realize that there are very, very few research level universities awarding a PhD in many areas. And so uh, PhDs coming in, fresh professors coming in, they've never they're not forced to, they're so locked into their discipline and their graduate studies that then they have no time to struggle with the vocation. In my experience, I did it through a Baptist campus ministry and I served in a number of roles there. And so it was very much a part of my life, but that's not everyone's experience. And it's not something that is intentionally done. It's kind of done just at the each individual person. So as you get into, uh, you know, then what does it mean? A lot of faculty feel like, well, I'm not trained. I'm not equipped to serve in that way. I'm not, I haven't been, have the background. Uh, now, some people actually don't even feel it should be their job to do that. I think if you t come to a, a Christian university, you need to, it needs to be a matter of prayer and calling because I think that is part of the job at a Christian university. It's not just the exclusivity of your discipline area. So there, there is a split there. So there's those who don't even think it should be done. I don't know that they should be there, but there are there is this other group who really feel they want to be there, but they haven't had the tools. One of the things that I have tried so much over my time at Sanford to do, and it's cultural. You've got to build a culture in which people can begin to feel free as faculty to talk about their faith to each other. They're coming from environments in which that is not to be done. And the the research universities that turn, turn them out as doctoral students do not, they frown on it. That That is no part of it. So you've got to begin to ease them back into integrating their their learning it would be called and their faith and so we have set up some programs uh to do that one of the outcomes we now are having faculty and staff worship i preached at the faculty staff worship just last week but we that's a slow thing there are a number of universities that have done a great job with scholars writing about it but it comes to your point about practice how do you live that out? It's lived out through creating uh, venues to talk about faith. So we have we have a leadership academy. We took that leadership academy down to Marion, Alabama, to retrace the history uh, of Howard College, and they had great discussions with the current pastor of that church and saw it. Things like that to to begin to change the culture is what I think is needed. That is unfortunately a slow, slower process, and it has to be intentional over a period of decades. We did not get to where we are quickly. It will take us some intentional discipline and discipling to get us where we need to be, I think, within the Christian higher ed community. I have a, uh, a daughter who is a freshman at a Christian school choosing that took a long time. One of the things that was required for admittance was a pastoral recommendation, an actual letter from a pastor who has a relationship with this individual and can speak to 
their life of discipleship, their life as a disciple. Um, to my knowledge, such a pastoral recommendation is not required um, if you want to teach at a Christian school. And I'm not anti-academic, like, right? I went to school for a long time. I have a fancy degree too, but it it is not, that does not mean that you have ever made a disciple or even that you have been discipled. It means that you were smart enough and you were wealthy enough or willing to go into debt far enough and you were well-connected enough to get a degree that's advanced. And then once you have the advanced degree, suddenly we imagine that you are the person who should be discipling the next generation of people. And that the two those two things couldn't actually be further from the truth necessarily. So I actually think a pastoral recommendation where you actually have, there's a pastor who is willing to articulate and demonstrate that this person who has applied to teach in an institution of higher education uh, that's Christian can articulate, yes, this person is a disciple. These are the transform transformations I've seen happen along the course of their life. And these are the people they have discipled. This is their model of discipleship. This is their pedagogy in relationship to uh, making a disciple. I don't think most places are asking for that kind of credentialing among the faculty. Would you help the church think more about discipleship? Would you help us get the conversation started to talk about the biblical discipleship Jesus gave us? Please follow us. Our website, www.thediscipledilemma.com. You can find us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and all the RSS feeds. If you'd follow or like us, you'll help us get leverage in the digital marketplace to talk about the fact that discipleship needs to be talked about. And as always, folks, thanks for listening. 